What is going on guys? Dayton here, aka Dr. Auto Flower, back to Inside the Grow Room with another video. Doing some more questions and answers. Been getting a lot of questions lately, so these videos kind of help get those uh, answered so everyone can see, everyone can learn from it, and uh, helps the community, helps keep things going on the channel here. Little update on my garden. Uh, I just did some cloning with my photo period girls. Uh, clones are started, so in about a week or so, we're going to have those all going in the tents. And I did want to have some autoflowers going here right away, but I think I may be waiting a little bit for the autoflowers because I may be getting some brand new genetics to be trying out. But today we're going to talk more autoflower info. Also, before we start, I want to give you guys a huge shout out. Thank you guys so much for smashing the like buttons, for leaving comments down below, uh, leaving questions. It really helps the algorithm. These videos have been in a lot of traction, so I'm really thankful for that. Um, it's uh, picking up the channel's pace of growth. So it's getting me more pumped, makes me want to get out there and make more videos, make more content for you guys. I never ask for donations or anything like that. If you guys want to help out, one of the biggest things you can do to help out is just smash that like button. Uh, let's try to get over 1,000. And also, if you do want to help support the channel and you're looking for a new grow light, and if you want to grow with the LED lights I use, I can hook you up with uh, discount codes for Optic LED Grow Lights. And you can message me up and I can help you choose which grow light would be perfect for your grow situation. You can contact me at drautoflowerled at gmail.com or on my Instagram at drautoflower. I can hook you up with some discount codes and help you save some money. And one more thing before I get into this video, I just started a brand new mushroom channel called Mush Lovin'. It's an educational mushroom channel where I talk about my experiences, information, how I've been using it medically and uh, beginner stuff. So definitely go check that out. I'll be putting a link down below in the description and comment section. If you can head over there and leave a like on the video and uh, subscribe, I'd be really appreciative. And with that out of the way guys, let's get right into the video. All right, Chris Bethman says, I've been giving seedlings some light silica at the transplanting. They get so stiff, you can hardly bend them. Any thoughts? Um, I probably wouldn't give seedlings any silica. I probably wouldn't even start with silica until like week two or three at least when they start getting some growth um, and very light too at the beginning. I'm guessing you're maybe talking about photo periods but you could be talking about autoflowers too. Some people like to transplant. Now for autoflowers I don't even really give silica maybe a little bit at like week three and a half maybe four and then I watch after. If, if they're looking really sturdy and not flimsy at all uh, I don't really even give much silica. Maybe I'll give one or two feedings of silica throughout the entire lifespan. Sometimes I don't even give silica at all. Uh, I normally just give silica to plants that like kind of seem a little lanky, kind of seem a little flimsy with their their branching and stuff. Normally just photo periods. Autoflowers, it's really what they look like. Are, are they a flimsy autoflower? Are they lanky autoflower? Um, if they're like stout and kind of short, I definitely probably wouldn't give barely any. Um, that's kind of my take on the silica thing for autoflowers. Silica really seems to help uh, strengthen up the branches, uh, stiffen them up like you said, but that's not really something you would want when they're in seedling stage, so I would probably avoid it. Sebring asks, with the CO2 levels higher these days than normal, is there really a need to add CO2 to your grow? Have you noticed any difference when adding CO2? So I pretty much only use uh, like homemade style or or mycelium bag CO2. That's pretty much the only CO2 I've used in my garden. The homemade style uh, with like yeast and stuff, kind of a waste of time when recommend it. Uh, I believe TNB does that. Kind of a waste of money and waste of time in my opinion. I think I saw someone do a test where they tested it and it's just a very small amount that's coming out. But when I was using the mycelium bag, uh, I also saw people do tests with that. And I saw a study before where people were getting, I think, 200 parts per million more CO2 in their gardens when using those bags. Uh, not a huge difference, but I think it did help a little bit. Uh, the plants looked really good and healthy when I was using it. Um, really no complaints. They didn't look worse. They looked just as good, maybe a little bit better than normal. But people say when you're growing in your house, you're already producing enough CO2 just with your exhaling. That pretty much all they need really. Is it a must? No, definitely not a must. You don't have to go out and go buy a CO2 tank or something like that. I kind of see it as like one of the very last things you would want to kind of upgrade. Um, you would want to like get everything else down packed, 
like all your growing style then once your growing is going really good and uh, there's not much more you could upgrade then you'd probably want to go get some co2 and start dabbling in that but as a new grower you definitely don't need it it's not something i would worry about you should be more focusing on your growing techniques and getting that all down packed your plants will come out just fine without it and you'll still get awesome results Arcel McGowan says, I'm loving the winter. My, my humidity stays between 45 and 55. I unplug the dehumidifier in the summer. In the summer, I'm changing my dehumidifier two to three times a day. Uh, that actually sounds pretty similar to what I'm getting, uh, which is 45 to 55% humidity like you. But for me, it's actually the opposite. I use my dehumidifier during the winter time and then I don't use it during the summertime because the summer, I can just open a window and it really helps keep the humidity down. I live in a pretty dry area and that's also something really important to know. If you're having humidity issues where your humidity is too high, then you might want to go out and get a dehumidifier. Uh, they are a little bit expensive, but they really work. And for me, it helps keep my humidity exactly where I need to and make sure there's not an excess amount and make sure there's no molds and whatnot forming. I usually have to change it out at least once or one and a half times a day. Dale Ross says, I just started growing autoflowers. My first grow, I found out these plants don't like fertilizer or CalMag. I now top dress. Can you give me more information? So like I've talked about in other previous videos, autoflowers can be very, very touchy on nutrients and how much you're giving them. And that also can vary too. Some strains, some genetics just can handle nutrients better some will be hungrier and some can get stressed very easily by giving them too much and you can just overfeed them easily and they can be very touchy so you have to watch out for it so i would recommend when you're using nutrients you would probably want to give them like a quarter what the actual instructions say with your nutrients uh, you want to start low and go slow so if you have no idea if your autoflowers are touchy or not start at one quarter strength and slowly go up and if you're starting to see any burning tips or anything like that any stress then you're going to want to ease back off after you do this for a while you're going to find a happy medium and you're going to find where your sweet spot is on the cow meg thing you really don't want to go too much on the cow meg uh, i give sometimes preventative cow meg feedings usually around maybe week four or so or maybe week three and a half which for me could be anywhere from like week three and a half to week five. I would, I would give like one feeding of Calameg and I would only give another feeding uh, if I actually saw the need for it. When you're growing with LEDs, uh, your plants will actually need a little bit more Calameg than usual. But like other nutrients, you want to go low and go slow. Give maybe only one or two preventative uh, feedings of Calameg. And after that, only if you see issues with Calameg deficiency. Few our line says, hey bro, can you plant more than one seed in a five gallon pot? I wouldn't. Uh, the only time I would is if I'm growing maybe regular plants and I just didn't have the extra space for it and maybe I had a lot of extra seeds or something, then yeah, if there is a chance one of them could be males, then I, I've done that in the past where I've had a bunch of seeds and I was like, okay, I'll just put it in there. And if I need to, I can just rip one out and I didn't really care about wasting the seed. Uh, but normally I would not recommend it. Uh, your plant is going to want to grow up in that whole area and take it over with their roots. If they're fighting other plants for a root space, then you're going to have decreased yield and they're not going to grow as big and as good. Jay Lynn asks, what kind of soil do you use? So I use Promix HP. It seems to be a very easy hydroponic store kind of soil to find. Usually very clean. I have had a few like gnat problems with it, but normally not much issue at all. It has a little bit of nutrients for when they're seedlings and then you're pretty much good to go to add all your nutrients and uh, feed them how you like. I've also had some really good grows mixing like high quality cocoa with uh, Promix HP. I would do two parts of Promix HP, one part of the cocoa and it needs to be high quality cocoa that's already been cleaned and stuff so there's no ph issues um yeah i had awesome results with it and if i could get a supply of good quality cocoa again where i live i'd probably want to try it again but here it's kind of a hassle so i just stick with promix hp and i have great results dave schmitz says specifically how can i tell the difference between an autoflower and a non i'm guessing you mean a non-autoflower 
So this is actually a great question because you could be like me and how I got into autoflowers. You could have been given some seeds and you could have no idea what it is and you could be getting autoflowers and you didn't even know it. So how I actually found out all about what autoflowers were is when I first started and got my first seeds from a friend, uh, I think they had no idea what they were. They just gave me some seeds and I planted them and tried it out. Two months down the road, my plants are reflowering. I'm running uh, 20 hours of light and I'm wondering what's going on. Uh, I thought these plants were in veg, but they're already flowering. I, I couldn't comprehend because it was my first grow. So I started doing research and I found out these are autoflowers. And I'm like, what is this? So I learned all about Ruderalis and how it was uh, bred into regular plants and got the autoflowering trait, which means it flowers by the number of days it's alive instead of the photo period it's receiving. So probably the most for sure way to tell between autoflowers and photo periods is both of them will form uh, the white pistil hairs over a month or two of vegetative growth and that's all. They won't do anything else. They'll produce some white hairs, maybe one or two at the bud site, and that's it. They won't go any further. If you start seeing multiple white pistil hairs coming out of the bud sites or little buds starting to form, that's pretty much the indicator that you have an autoflower and it's starting to flower on you. This is what happened to me and I was so confused by this. I, I didn't even know what it was. This was about 14, 15 years ago when I first did this and the genetics I had wasn't fully autoflower so it was really slowly going into flower. Once I flipped it into flower it went much faster. And that can happen with uh, unstable genetics. Sometimes it'll be super super slow flowering and then once you start flipping into 12 and 12 it'll pick up much faster and pick up the photo period traits more. But if they start forming buds on vegetative time like uh, 18 hours of light or 20 hours of light or 24 hours of light then you know they're pretty much out of flowers. Julio Ortiz says, have you ever tried treating a photo period like an auto? I would probably have to say a no to that uh, because they're two different things and uh, auto flowers, you try to be less stressful with it. Photo periods, I don't really care. You can be pretty brutal with them and they'll do fine. Like as you see in some of my videos, I do some crazy super cropping. I do major leaf stripping with my uh, photo periods. I know they'll bounce back in like a couple days. Um, they can handle it and they can handle much more stress than an autoflower would. Autoflowers, I keep the stress to a bare minimum. I'll do some lollipopping, not as much as photo periods. I'll do some leaf stripping, but not as much as photo periods. Uh, for training, I will most likely always do LSTing, low stress training, compared to like high stress training, which is like super cropping or uh, topping and stuff. I normally save that for photo periods. I tell grow 506 says should I lollipop autoflowers and if so when should I start doing it? Uh, I do so I probably take off the first quarter or so of the plant uh, like everything that will produce just like larf fluffy buds I go down there and I take that off probably I start around probably week three and a half, four, maybe five. It really depends on how the autoflower looks for me, but I would say around that time, probably week four is a good time to maybe do your first one. Uh, you'll probably have to do a second one, maybe week five and a half or so, maybe week six. If it starts uh, growing back in those areas, you don't want the energy going back into those areas, trying to form new uh, buds or new leaves or new little stems sticking out. Here's a comment that touches on one of the questions we got last time where someone asked, can you run autoflowers on 12 and 12? Uh, Philip Moore says, just did a 12 and 12 run, big loss, it won't help an auto. So that's like what I said, it's not gonna help produce better, it's only gonna decrease your yield and lower its potential of what you could yield and what it could grow to. But if you really wanted to, if you wanted to experiment, if you just want an extra plant in there, I'd say go for it, try it out. But if you want full potential, full growth with it, I would say probably just wait or have your own autoflower tent. And for the last comment here, Jared Ritter asks, uh, I just wish I could go to the store and buy 7.0 water because I just hate pHing the mix. My effing meter needs to be calibrated and I don't have any pH packets for calibration. 
and I'm just using distilled water mixed with the Fox Farm nutrients and praying for the best. Does anyone believe that I'm okay? Will my plants be okay? Um, personally, uh, I think if you're using distilled water, it should probably be 7.0 or very close to that. Back when I was beginning, I used Fox Farm as well. I didn't really pH it much. I still came out with some pretty damn good results. Do you have to always pH it? Uh, unless you're having issues, then I would say probably not. You're probably going to get by and you'll be okay. If you are having pH issues and you're seeing it in your plants, um, then yeah, you probably would. And I probably would recommend switching over to pH Perfect Advanced Nutrients. It sounds like you would really benefit from it. And uh, for me, it's been so nice to not have to worry about pH issues anymore. As long as you're kind of close to 7.0, you pretty much do not have to uh, test your pH or anything. And touching on the calibration thing you mentioned, uh, that is something you need to do and kind of regularly with the uh, pH meter. What you can do is go online, Amazon has it, I'm pretty sure. There is pH calibration fluid you can buy on like Amazon. For me, I think I bought like a pH 7.0 uh, Blue Lab, Blue Tech or something like that. If you search on Amazon, I'm sure you could find it. And pretty much what it is, is just a dead on 7.0 mixture. You would just calibrate it using that and uh, you should be good to go. But yeah, I think that's it for this video, guys. Hope this information has helped you guys. Again, please smash that like button down below. Make sure you leave a question down in the comments there if you want to get a question answered. We'll do some more of these before the garden gets up and running and uh, full swing into this next season. So stay tuned and thank you all for watching. Until next time, peace out. Catch you guys later.